Namaste everybody and welcome. Before I start though, I will attempt to offer my obeisances to my spiritual master. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Srimati Siddha Swarupananda Paramahamsurti Namane Bhajashi Krishna Shaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Adoita and Gadha Shri Vasade Gobakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jai Srila Prabhupada So the title for today's class is This World Another World and obviously it's a two-part class. So let's begin with the first part this world. So this world, this material world is by nature dark and we're going to look at that darkness from two angles. First of all, it naturally needs a light source throughout the different planets, uh, the different countries on a planet, doesn't matter where you are, you need a light source the sun. So when the sun is sometimes covered by clouds during the day, everything kind of feels grey, doesn't it? And at night time, you need moonlight. And that's why full moon nights are very nice. But when there's no moonlight, it's very dark. It has rather kind of scary atmosphere to it then too, doesn't it? So every planet, every universe, we'll go even further, every universe has a sun to illuminate it and that sun is proportionate in size to the size of that universe. But even, for example, in this universe that we are currently residing in, um, the sun doesn't reach all the lower planets. There are some lower planets that don't have any sunlight. And so in order to be able to navigate their way around on that planet, there are these huge cobras who have a jewel on their head. And it is this jewel that light emanates from. And so the people who live on those particular lower planets can find their way around by the light from this jewel on the cobras. But it's a double-edged sword because that's how the cobras find their prey as well. Not all the lower planets are like that, just some of them. But let's also look at another meaning for darkness. In the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita, it begins with, I was born in the darkest ignorance and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. And every morning we sing to our spiritual master, he opens my darkened eyes and fills my heart with transcendental knowledge. So this is the other darkness that is here in the material world, this ignorance, this lack of knowledge, lack of spiritual knowledge, not lack of knowledge. I mean, there's so much knowledge about how to operate machines, how to do this, how to build a car. We're not talking about that kind of knowledge. We're talking about spiritual knowledge. And this is far greater problem than the lack when the sun gets covered over. Even even those uh, countries on this planet that had very long winters in the Northern Hemisphere, there's some European countries, Norway and Sweden and those countries, they have very long winters and it seems like there's very little sunshine. So we're not, and, and it really impacts on people. People can become quite depressed after a couple of months of not much sunshine. So we're not, that's a problem, isn't it? But the 
Darkness of ignorance is the greatest problem throughout the universes. And it's not dependent on the proportional size of the sun. It is dependent upon how much a person is listening to their spiritual master, is listening to the saintly people who with the torchlight of knowledge are shining forth into people's hearts spiritual knowledge. So the material world is filled with darkness, with ignorance, spiritual ignorance. And the greatest ignorance, the foundation is when we think we are this material body or the material mind or both. That's really the platform for all the ignorance, the darkness of this world. So this is all part of this reality of the material world and why we need a spiritual master who with the shining lamp of knowledge, he, uh, because of him, we get to see what this world's really about. And Krishna becomes even more attractive to us. You know, in, um, in yoga, there's a mudra um, a lotus mudra. So with the hands, you can do like a lotus. And the lotus, when the lotus is closed up, because a lotus won't open unless there is sunlight. So the lotus stays closed when there's not enough sunlight. So that's what we are like here in this material world. You can see all the potential there in a closed lotus. You can see the potential of beauty and love and compassion, but they're closed up due to the influence of the illusory energy. But as we become influenced by the devotees and by Krishna, gradually, petal by petal, the lotus flower opens up and then the lotus flower is fully blooming with all the qualities of a lotus. So let's go on to the second part of this class, which is about another world. Another world where the lotus is fully open. The heart is fully open open to Krishna and is experiencing all the qualities of the soul, of blissfulness, knowledge, their spiritual form. This is what the spirit of the lotus fully opened is. That's the saintly people. So let us now listen to just a couple of descriptions of another world. You may have heard descriptions, beautiful descriptions of the cowherd boys, the Gopi girls in Vrindavan and their relationships with Krishna. For example, the Gopi Sudevi. She is very sweet and charming and always remains at the side of her dear friend Radharani. And Sudevi arranges Radharani's hair she is expert in training parrots and roosters. Sudevi is also an expert sailor. How about that? When Radharani and Krishna, sometimes they'll go on a little, little boat and Sudevi is expert with rowing the boat. She also knows which flowers blossom with the rising of the moon. So this is just one of the living entities in the spiritual world, Sudevi. And she has very individual characteristics and service for Radharani and Krishna. But there are countless living entities in the spiritual world. And when Krishna was here in Gokula Vrindavan, I'll read you out just a couple because it's very, very long list too. I'll read out just a couple of the different um, living entities 
and their service that they did. And Srila Rupa Goswami, he describes these. So Krishna's peacock feather is actually a living entity. Krishna's peacock feather and the living entity's name is Nava Ratna Vidamba. So that's his service. He's Krishna's peacock feather. Krishna's signet ring is actually a living entity. His name is Ratna Mukti. Krishna's crown that he wears is a living entity. His name is Ratna Para. And Krishna's pearl necklace, he gets to lie there on Krishna's chest. Krishna's pearl necklace is called Taravali. Krishna's buffalo horn is called Mandra Gosa. And his buffalo horn, Krishna uses it as a bugling instrument. Ooh. This instrument is always highly polished and circled with gold bands on it. Krishna's cane, sometimes Krishna, you see him in pictures, paintings, he's carrying a cane, especially when he's out cow herding. His cane is a living entity called Mandana. Krishna has a fan and his fan is called Maru Maruta. <laughs> Krishna's flutes. There are three kinds of flutes used by Krishna. One is called Vinu, one is called Murali, and the third one is Vamsi. So these are kinds of flutes because they have specific um, dimensions to them. Vinu is very small, not more than six inches long, with six holes for whistling. <laughs> Morali is about 18 inches long with a hole at the end and four holes on the body of the flute. This flute produces a very enchanting sound. The Vamsi flute is about 15 inches long with nine holes on its body. So he's got the short flute, a middle sized flute and a longer flute. These are the kinds of flutes. And these flutes have specific names. Sarala is one of the names of one of Krishna's flutes. And the Sarala flute has a low, soft tone, like the sound of softly singing cuckoos. And Krishna is very fond of playing this flute. So, Krishna's flute, they all have names and Krishna's relating to them and he plays them at different times on different occasions. Very wonderful. Krishna's clothes. Let's, let's look at Krishna's clothes. The tailor who sews Krishna's clothes is Ruchika. So a lot of people in this world like to be tailors. My sister Jivananda Dasi, she's a very good sewer. So there is a tailor who makes Krishna's clothes. Krishna's servants who expertly wash Krishna's laundry, Ranjana and Saranga, they expertly wash his laundry. Isn't that wonderful? In this material world, being a servant who washes somebody's clothes is seen as very lowly, but there with Krishna is a wonderful service. Krishna's servants who decorate him with various ornaments and clothing are Kandala, and Mahaganda, and he has many others as well. And goldsmiths who make ornaments for Krishna are Rangjana and Tantkana. They are specifically goldsmiths for Krishna. So wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> because you see the perverted reflection of all this here in this material world. I just do two more, and these ones really fascinated me. Krishna's spies. Krishna has expert spies who travel in various disguises. So they travel around in disguise, and they come back and tell Krishna things. Krishna, 
He's the Paramatma. He's the Lord in the heart. He knows what everybody's doing and thinking. But he likes to have fun too. So he has spies that he sends. And they love dressing up and disguising themselves so nobody knows who they are. Here in this material world, we have like James Bond movies. Krishna has his James Bond, doesn't he? <laughs> so Krishna also has artists. And in our family, we have many artists in our family, so they will like to hear this. Krishna has artists who are very talented and they paint pictures for Krishna. So two of those artists are Sukritra and Vikritra. So there are just some of the living entities who perform wonderful variety of service for Krishna. Years ago, a gentleman was very confidently purporting to everybody that there's no way that we can ever know what God looks like. It's just not possible. And you can understand from, from his background because in the Christian um, scriptures, in the Islamic scriptures, there really isn't much description of what God looks like. Wonderfully, there is indication that God has form. They'll talk about he's big or he's shiny or his voice is grave. All these things indicate a supreme person. And this is wonderful. This is dampening down in personalism, isn't it? But the Vedic scriptures give full descriptions of the Supreme Lord. These saintly people, Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, all these wonderful saintly people have really compiled a lot of scriptures for us to read about descriptions about Krishna, the Supreme Lord. So I'm going to finish off now with a story, very, very very small story about Krishna and having dinner at night time. This is when he was in Gokula Vrindavan. So you can hear about the Supreme Lord when he's a little boy and he's having dinner at night time. So let's begin the story. Mother Rohini finished cooking the evening meal for Krishna and Balaram. She came out of the kitchen and said, Mother Yasoda, everything is ready for the boys. The excited servants heard this and happily placed the plates, the water jugs and little jeweled seats in their proper places. So they were setting the table. <laughs> Krishna, Balaram and Madhu Mangala were already bathed and dressed and they quickly came to the dining hall. Mother Yasoda seated them and happily served fragrant cold water. She then served sweet cakes cooked by Radha Rani while saying, oh boys, these are your favorite sweets. Please eat them up with great delight. You see, Mother Yasoda knew that Krishna loved these little cakes that Radha Rani made and Radha Rani loved making these cakes each day for Krishna. Madhu Mangala called out loudly while munching his food. Oh, mother, if one smells these cakes, he will disregard heaven and liberation. What a curse that I don't have an unlimited belly. Furthermore, I consider anyone who says, I don't want any more sweets, to be the worst offender. <laughs> Madhu Mangala loved his food. Krishna and Balaram laughed at Madhu Mangala's jokes and made each other laugh as they ate and drank. Upon finishing their meal, they went off to relax. So it's a very jovial time, eating dinner at night time with Krishna and Balaram. Mother Yasoda was there, Nanda Maharaj was there. Krishna and Balaram, their clothing and ornaments had become a little spoiled while eating, they dropped some of the food on their clothes. So they put on fresh clothing and they freshened their mouths with water. Meanwhile, after dinner, Nanda Maharaj went into the palace theatre hall. Hmm. Many talented artists had arrived 
to entertain everyone. Expert clowns, dancers, singers and storytellers gathered there just to please Krishna. The audience arrived and was seated. The audience included members of the family, Brahmins and the cowherd men. Nanda Maharaj greeted the guests very nicely and the guests were pleased, but their minds and eyes were eager to see Krishna. Nanda thought, my son has just eaten and is now resting. However, all the Vrajvasis have come to see him, so what should I do? Just at that moment, Krishna arrived in the theatre hall with his friends. Jaya, Jaya, shouted all the artists who had assembled on the stage and they started the evening's entertainment. Various performers recited the Vedas, praised Krishna, played loudly on different musical instruments and made loud whooping noises. <laughs> so wonderful. At one point, the audience became a little boisterous that means a little loud, as they watched the performances. They were so excited watching, yeah? And Nanda Maharaj ordered his constables to restore the peace. They raised their sticks and gestured with their hands that the guests should relax and sit properly. <laughs> they quieted them all down. <laughs> Nanda then signalled for the actors to continue their performances. Male and female artists enacted dances where they danced while balancing plates. Actually in China, they do this still to this day. They have um, the actors on the stage, acrobats, and they'll have these sticks and these plates twirling as they're, as they're dancing. It's, it's magical to watch. So this is what they did when Krishna was present. Actors dramatized the pastimes of Lord Rama, and Lord Nishrimadev. So they put on plays about Lord Rama and Lord Nishrimadev. <laughs> there were magicians, jugglers, and some acrobats balancing upon raised bamboo poles. Some showed tricks, such as passing a string into one nostril and bringing it out the other. <laughs> Some skilled pundits instantly composed poems glorifying Krishna's birth and activities. Ah, they would have loved to hear that. Musicians played pleasingly on flutes, gongs, venas, cartels, and other instruments. After the show, Nanda Maharaj and wealthy visitors rewarded the performers with gold, ornaments and expensive clothes. The artists, however, were fully satisfied simply seeing Krishna, but they accepted the charity merely out of respect for Nanda Maharaj and his friends. The audience started crying tears of love while looking at the sweet face of Krishna. This is very, all these things are going on on stage and, and but they're still fascinated by Krishna and they're so happy they've got tears running down their cheeks. This is nighttime entertainment. This is a trillion, 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 trillion times better than Netflix, isn't it? At that time, Mother Yasoda's servant named Raktak entered the theatre hall and after offering her respects to Nanda Maharaj, she whispered, O oh King, Queen Yasoda is very eager to behold her darling son. Nanda Maharaj requested his son to leave the hall. Krishna knew that the guests would be sad that he was leaving, so he kindly glanced at them with sweet smiles before going to his mother. Krishna Balaram, Madhu Mangala and their friends joyfully sat down and drank warm condensed milk mixed with sugar and a pinch of camphor and that was served by Mother Yasoda. That's their nighttime bedtime drink. 
Krishna then said farewell to all his friends. They went home to their houses. Mother Yasoda and Mother Rohini took Krishna and Balaram to their bedroom and laid them to rest in separate beds. Good night, Krishna. So uh, isn't it wonderful to hear about the activities of Krishna, despite the fact that some people think that we will never know what God looks like. But as our spiritual master told us, we not only know what he looks like, we know where he lives. We know what happens at night time before he goes to bed. So much wonderful, continual loving relationships with all the living entities and with Krishna. So wonderful, so that's another world. So by hearing about Krishna and chanting Krishna's names and looking upon the sweet face of Krishna, we're not in this world of darkness anymore. We're in another world. So thank you very much, everybody. Namaste.